I took the road less traveled. Um, when I first got to MIT, I got, I got here, I think I can say probably before any one of you, because I was in soccer, so I got here a week before even Russian orientation. So they stuck me in Baker, in a big quad with nobody else. And as I'm lying in this bed, hearing the screeches of, of uh, Memorial Drive, cars along Memorial Drive, I thought, thought to myself, okay, I'm here, now what? <laughs> Happenstance, 10 years later, um, after multiple uh, graduate degrees, PhD, and my dad really, really anxious to me ever getting a real job. <laughs> um, I kept asking myself, the, I found myself asking the same question, what next? And there was a, I, there, were, there were a couple things that I knew I didn't want to do. I didn't want to be stuck in a lab. Having, been done, having done that, I decided that I, I had enough. I didn't want to be a professor. All my friends who were professors have had a lot of trouble getting funding. So I saw something about patent There's a, there a, an IP firm that needed a scientific advisor. And the more I looked into it, the more I said, hmm, this is actually a very attractive uh, subject for me. Uh, it, it engaged me because intellectually, you, you have to learn new technologies and you have to learn the law. And that's essentially, when I came to MIT, what I really wanted. Uh, that and, and the fact that I knew I was going to never win an argument with my wife, so I figured I'd argue with the government. It's going to be a lot easier. <laughs> so, uh, there are three or four basic fields in intellectual property. Patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. Um, patents protect the idea, an idea. Um, copyrights protect an expression, a, a tangible medium of an idea. Trademarks protect the origin of goods or services. Trade secrets protect something that is valuable to a company. Of these, three of these, the government gives you certain rights so that you have to do something in front of the government. Patents and trademarks are examined by examiners of the patent office, <clears throat> patent and trademark office. You send in something and examiners look at it and, and automatically reject it. <laughs> Copyright's a little easier. Just, just send stuff into the pat or into the uh, Library of Congress, and they say, "Okay, great, you've got a you've got a copyright." Trade secrets, the easiest of all in in some respects. You have a trade secret. You have something that's valuable. You keep it secret, but it becomes known. That's it. You've got no. You've got almost no protection. Uh, with patents, patents give you the most potential for, for uh, money, monetary value. Uh, billion dollar judgments have been, have been obtained, so you have to jump through a lot of hoops. Uh, things have to be, the, the basic requirements are useful, novel, non-obvious, very, very subjective, and you have to clearly discuss what's actually in uh, the, the, what your idea is. Doesn't give you the right to do anything. Gives you the right to, to stop others from doing it. It's like it's like a property right. If you have a piece of property, a real property, you can't do whatever you want with it. The one thing you can do is you can be that, that old man or old woman saying, "Get off my lawn." <laughs> Patents are the same way, generally. Um, does anyone know, by the way, trade secrets? What the most famous trade secret is? Coca-Cola. Right, Coca-Cola. It's, it's supposedly in. Bits of the formula in three different safes, of which different people have different have the combination of only one of those safes. <clears throat> All right. So on the legislative front, there are certain in the last ten years there have been two major pieces of legislation. One is Obama under Obama the AIA the American Invents Act, the first major piece of legislation since 1953 on patents. Uh, it, it did a number of things, but the biggest things were to create additional avenues, ways to challenge patents that have been granted. The idea was that a lot of people were, were worried that it's time, it costs a lot of time and a lot of money to challenge patents in court. And it, so there was this idea of, of creating a parallel path to go through the patent office and challenge it. 
taking less time by statute, it's only two years, and a lot less money, a couple hundred thousand dollars versus a couple million dollars in the court system. <clears throat> there are various avenues, of which the, the most important one is the IPR, the inter, um, inter parties re-examination. Re I'll talk about that a little bit later. <clears throat> With the, um, the Trade Secrets Act, stealing trade secrets, you all know some stories that have been in the news about Chinese nationals taking things overseas, getting caught. Um, trade secrets used to be, until the Trade Secrets Act was passed two years ago, um, state by state. So what you had to prove, the way you kept things secret, varied what de depending on the state that you were in. What the, federal, the Uniform Trade Secret Act did is federalize everything. So now you can sue in state court or federal court, and federal court, the requirements, the, the remedies are all the same throughout the states. So some of the more fun cases, copyright, by the way, always gets the fun, most fun cases. <laughs> this is Naruto versus Slater. If you haven't heard about this, there's a, a naturalist, a pho photographer, uh, Slater, David Slater, who went to Indonesia to photograph monkeys. Uh, while he was dealing with his stuff, one of the monkeys grabbed his camera and took a bunch of selfies. And it turned out the monkey was a better photographer than he was. So he took the, you know, got his equipment back eventually and said, these are great photographs. He put them up, licensed them. People were, were uh, he was making money from the copyright. And PETA found out that the monkey had taken it. So PETA decided, it's not fair. You don't own the copyright, the monkey owns it. <laughs> and sued him in federal court. Well, this went to, not only went to court, it went to the appeals court, not once, but twice. And the appeals court was not very happy with PETA. They said, one, you, the Copyright Act does give people, interested parties, the right to sue on behalf of other parties. Doesn't give you the right. You have no relationship with that monkey. Besides being, maybe being the uncle. Um, the other thing is that the monkey actually does not, there's nothing in the Constitution that says a monkey does not have the rights of a human. However, the Copyright Act, the court said, is written specifically so for humans to have those rights only. So, statutorily, the monkey didn't have rights. <laughs> Some of the other, the other cases down at the bottom, uh, Star Athletica was a case about cheerleaders' uniforms, and the court basically said, you can separate the, the new piece, the exciting new cheerleaders' uniform from the actual uniform itself, you got yourself a deal. The other one, much more uh, of interest, Kearsang. Kearsang was a very smart graduate student. He, he lived in the West Coast. He went home to, I think it was uh, the Philippines, and was able to buy his books and ship them over to the U.S. cheaper than it cost to buy the books in the U.S. So he did this in droves, sold, sold books at a profit, and John Wiley said, wait a minute. And the court said, no, you, you sold the books, you've got your right, your copyright, he has the right to sell it internationally. Uh, trademark, the slants. Uh, this was actually decided just this year. Uh, Simon Tam was the lead singer of an Asian band in San Francisco. He filed a, cop a trademark for the slants. Uh, wanting, and the trademark, the Lanham Act, which is the trademark act, said, hey, wait a minute, we're not allowed to give a trademark to disparaging, um, disparaging uh, words, so you're not going to get the trademark. And Sam said, uh, Tam said, I'm going to take back this term. And he did. The Supreme Court said, you know what? It's it's free speech issue. Just because we're giving you a right doesn't mean that you don't have the right to, to that word. It's free speech. That's fine. So um, expect to see the Washington Redskins and the Kansas City Chiefs. There, were, there was a lot of litigation the last couple of years. Expect that they will now continue to use, and the Cleveland Indians continue to use this. Uh, fun trademark cases. Uh, my favorite is Boise State, uh, the exclusive use route uh, to use uh, right to use blue turf. Donald Trump tried to uh, trademark uh, your fire. <laughs> Just last week, Play-Doh trademarked their smell. 
Slight sweet, slightly musky. <laughs> so there's a list. Hit Sarah Palin, of course, screwed up. Didn't sign her name. Um, so my, patents are not just exciting patents like you know, the, the laser and the transistor. We also have my favorite offer, coffee having nicotine. In case that cup of coffee just isn't enough. <laughs> Dog air providers, a high five, an automated high five machine if you need the pickup. Uh, butt kicker. <laughs> uh, this one is a big hit in Wisconsin. They have five, two, five, and ten year cheddar flavors. And, and uh, can anyone tell me when you think this one came out? The anti fits eating nuts. <laughs> Good guess. I knew that was going to be the guess. No, actually this is 1980. It was right after George Romero uh, zombie movies. Uh, motorized ice cream cones. You just can't, can't uh, twist and turn en enough. And of course, the life expectancy timepiece where you put in all of the variables about how long uh, your, your lifestyle, and it will tell you to the second when you will die. <laughs> Except it has a reset button in case you screwed up. Uh, so now the real stuff. Why are patents important? Really, there are a number of things that, that reasons why people have patents. Uh, there are a number of business opportunities. You have revenue opportunities. Uh, it's, it encourages innovation. It encourages <coughs> negotiation between different companies, uh, there are opportunities to, uh, to, to for foster a company. Arthur Anderson had a number of patents in their field and they're able to obtain consulting contracts because they had these patents. Clients like this. Also, allow, they're, they're, they're a good way to disseminate knowledge. <sighs> Supreme, so recent Supreme Court cases, Supreme Court has been the most active Supreme Court in the last 30 years. In the last 10 years, they've heard more cases than the previous 30 years combined, and they're all problematic for patents. They're all making patents more difficult to obtain, uh, killing off procedural issues, making it easier to challenge patents, and decreasing the ability to do anything with those patents. Of these, probably the most, the most damaging is eBay, which says, you know what? Patents are supposed to be an exclusionary right, so if you have them, you're supposed to be, ex be able to use the stick to bring people to negotiate by saying, you know what, I'm going to block you from doing anything else. eBay said, Supreme Court said, wait a minute. No, it's a balancing act. So now, what that does is it changes the calculus and allows companies to do what's called in in uh, efficient infringing. So they say, you know what, we've got all these, these various ways of of um, killing patents, IPRs I told you about before. Um, IPRs, you can file, if you're an interested party, if you're any party, you can file challenges based on, on any reference that the patent office hasn't looked at. And you can file them one after the other after the other, and they will get instituted by, by the, the patent office if they think there's an issue. And they think there's an issue about 80% of the time. 80 to 90 percent of the time, and of those, 75 percent of those patents go away. So think about this: <coughs> you lose your patent; it can get challenged at any time, and the remedies you have have been harder to get, as well as the types of things you can patent on. The court has has limited, and this is, by the way, the court has limited this solely based on what the court sees. This is not anywhere in the statute. They've limited what you're able to pack. So this is a real problem because there are a number of, of, um, of studies that have shown that a strong patent system fosters, uh, fosters innovation and fosters uh, GDP, increases your GDP. Uh, just, I, I'm, I'm running out of time here, so I, I'm sorry to... Uh, I have too many slides and too much too, uh, interest to me, at least. Um, the, the, the basic fact is that, that Chinese, the Chinese investors um, are going elsewhere. U.S. investors are going elsewhere. The number of startups in the U.S. has dropped dramatically in the last 10 years. And it's not only due to, due to the small number of small businesses decreasing because of big box stores. It's much more that... If you're an angel investor and you're the person you're going to invest in cannot protect what they're going to be investing in, you won't get that money. So I have a couple slides. 
Um, there is data on this, my time is up, just to show that there are very recent studies showing a direct correlation between a strong intellectual property system and GDP growth, you know, the, country, the strength of a country, uh, and, and the strength of innovation, and, and the strength of, of just the health, the health of the economy of a country in, as a whole. So with that, I've, I've already run over my time. Um, I have a lot more. <laughs> but, uh,